Well, welcome to the Science and Faith podcast with Dr. James Tour, and I'm your host, James Tour. And you can visit me and see my, my professional credentials at jmtour.com or my social media at drjamestour.com. And uh, this particular podcast is being done in collaboration with Cross Point Church and West University Baptist Church. And for future podcasts, you can go to signup.com drjamestour.com to be part of the questioning audience in the future. So I'm a real practicing scientist. That's what I do for a living. That's what I get paid to do. And I love Jesus more than anything else in the world. So if you put those two together, I'm sure that this is an unusual podcast. And my purpose for this podcast is unabashedly to see Jesus Christ glorified by seeing people get saved. And secondly, to have Christians built up in their faith. Now, with that, I want to introduce my speaker for today, Dr. Stephen Meyer, who's director of the Discovery Institute's Center for Science and Culture in Seattle. He's a trained scientist with undergraduate work in physics, a master's in philosophy of science from Cambridge, as well as a PhD from Cambridge. His doctoral thesis was of clues and causes, a methodological interpretation of origin of life research. And he's been, uh, uh, Dr. Meyer has been at, at uh, the Discovery Institute since 1996. And before that, he was both a professor and a geophysicist working here in the state of Texas. Uh, he's well known in, through TV appearances, podcasts, and debates through the Discovery Institute. He's written a number of different books, Exploring Explore Evolution from 2007, uh, 2009 Signature of the Cell, which I have here, big whopping 600 page book, very famous book, Signature of the Cell. And then also from 2000, 2013, uh, Darwin's Doubt, 2013. And uh, uh, let me get a good look there, Darwin's Doubt, 2013. And I think he has another newer book coming out. But uh, uh, so, Dr. Stephen Meyer, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Jim, and I'm sorry about all the technical difficulties we've had so far. We appreciate your, your taking time to join us. The first question I want to ask you is this. Why do you, as such an educated person, believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ? And what does that mean in your life? It's one of those few things that, if true, changes everything, right? Uh, the human condition is uh, undeniably um, limited. Uh, we live on a planet that spins in free space around the sun, and we get so many trips around, and then we're, we, we, no one gets off the planet alive. And uh, for me, I started reading the Gospels as a teenager after having had an experience of, I, I guess now I understand it to have been a kind of um, uh, metaphysical angst. It was a kind of anxiety that I was experiencing about whether life had any ultimate meaning. And it made me wonder if there was something wrong with me because I had questions popping into my head that I couldn't answer. And I, at some point, uh, decided to crack the, the family Bible that uh, was on the, the coffee table upstairs. I started with the Gospel of Matthew. And when I got to the end, I realized that it was, the, the if, if true, the, the Gospel narrative changed everything. And uh, I, I, at some point, I began to investigate the reliability of the biblical texts, and I found that there was tremendous historical support for the re reliability. I remember first encountering the work of Josephus and finding that the, um, the basic story of the gospel was repeated in secular historical sources. And then I later examined the, uh, the evidence for the resurrection itself, and there are three key facts. The, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, in fact, a very powerful argument called the minimal facts argument that's been developed by scholars such as William Lane Craig and uh, uh, Gary Habermas. And as you look at those, those three key facts, the, the, the empty tomb, the appearances of Jesus, and this explosive origin of Christianity in the Mediterranean world, it's very difficult to explain all three of these without the uh, with, with, without positing the an actual bodily resurrection. In fact, I think it's the best explanation of those facts and many others. For me, the testimony of James is incredibly important because James was uh, the, the uh, half-brother of Jesus. 
Uh, we know from the Gospels that he originally rejected the claims of Jesus to be the Messiah and the Son of God, uh, and something changed his mind very dramatically such that he was later the leader of the Jewish Jerusalem church. And we know from secular sources, in particular from Josephus, that he was martyred for his faith um, in about 60, 61 AD. So that, that, that's, uh, you start looking at that type of historical evidence, you have to ask, well, what changed James' mind? What changed Paul's mind? Uh, why were these early disciples uh, willingly accepting martyrdom, not for an abstract philosophy, but for something they said they saw and were in a position to know was false if um, on the basis of their own eyewitness testimony. So as I began to look at those historical sources, I found them very compelling that the gospel story was not only a story that gave us hope, but one that was grounded in historical fact. And, um, and it, it takes a while to kind of sift through all that evidence, but it's pretty powerful, and it's, it's, uh, it, it's convinced me. And it's, it, obviously the encounter with, with Christ, I mean, not, I shouldn't say obviously, but for me, the person of Christ encountered in the pages of Scripture is just a, a very compelling person. He brings together two things that we humans very rarely bring together. In fact, this happens over and over, but, you know, we have right now, um, you know, tenderhearted in our political discourse, you know, compassionate liberals and hard-headed conservatives, and and uh, Jesus seemed to bring together grace and truth. He brought them together in one person, and we tend to bifurcate. We accept one side or the other of a whole bunch of dichotomies, and so I found his person very unique. And then when I examined the claims of the the narratives uh, historically, uh, I became convinced that that what the Gospels were recording had actually happened. And uh, and so the human condition, I think, looks very different if you realize that. Um, there is life. There is every prospect of life eternal if um, if you accept the, the the gift that Christ is offering. Well, that's great. That's great. You know, I've never I've never heard it put that way. That no none of us are going to get off the planet alive. That's that's an interesting way of putting it. Uh, I guess it takes a philosopher to. Well, I'm, I'm to a sum bit of an amateur. I'm a bit of an amateur astronomer, Jim, and I've been I've been up late uh, last week looking at the comet and uh, and uh, last two nights beautiful views of Saturn and Jupiter and the moons and you, as you begin to to just uh, that, looking at the scar the, the the sky in that way and the night sky in particular and you realize the vastness of the universe where now the, the astronomers now tell us there's at least 200 billion galaxies the size of the Milky Way and then we have our own, you know, solar system, and uh, it, it is a beautiful system. Uh, uh, Newton said that this most beautiful system of, of, uh, of sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. It's a wonderful quote from the General Scolium. So there's a sense of order and beauty, but also, apart from the belief in a, in a divine creator, the vastness of the universe is kind of terrifying because you realize we're just on a one little blue blue dot, so anomalous, so unusual among all the, the the planetary bodies. We have liquid water here. We're just the right axial tilt to, we're just the right distance from a, a sun of just the right size to sustain life. It suggests design, but if you don't accept that, then we're we're just here for a little tiny speck of time on a little tiny speck and. What is mine, man? That that uh, that uh, you know the psalmist says, "What is man that thou art mindful of him?" But what if what if there's no one there, and we're we're all that's all that's the only conscious life on the planet? After we die, we rot, and that's it. So, to me, there's always been this kind of um, existential dichotomy. If God is real, then then meaning is possible. If He's not. Uh, then we can enjoy life as best we can for the short time we're here, but there, there's no possibility of ultimate meaning. You, nothing can mean anything to a planet or a rock or a star. Things only mean things to persons. So unless there's an ultimate person who can who exists after we we pass on, um, there is no 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 prospect of ultimate meaning to human existence. And I think that's why the resurrection and why God coming in the flesh and revealing Himself as the reality behind the universe really does change everything. Uh -huh. Beautiful. Thank you, Steve. Now, you, you, just, you just took this in a direction that I was hoping it was going to go. You, you, put, you, you talked a little bit about, about the fine-tuning of the universe. Now I want you to narrow that down and talk about the fine-tuning that it would take 
to have life or that it takes to have life. Talk about constants that you might know of or the fine tuning around life itself. I've got a new book coming out, as you know, about uh, extending the argument for intelligent design in an overtly theistic direction. I think I've written, as if you, on the origin of life problem. And uh, there's uh, uh, such exquisite evidence of design in the inner workings of the cell. But if you, uh, at least theoretically, some have proposed, even Francis Crick proposed, that, there, that the cell was designed and transported here to Earth. He was so taken with the severity of the origin of life problem, he suggested that maybe life had been... Um, had arisen someplace else in the cosmos and then it had been seeded here. It was a theory called directed panspermia. Uh, but even, but that's a, that's a strange theory. It doesn't really answer the ultimate question of the origin of biological information, for one, because to get life you have to have that code that makes all forms of life possible. And so in a sense, Crick and uh, others who proposed this kind of kicked the problem out into deep space without answering the ultimate problem, which is where do you get the information, the code that makes life possible? But in addition to that, uh, there's an even more fundamental level of design in the very fabric of the universe, the, the laws and the constants of physics, the initial conditions of the universe, and some of the contingent features of the universe, like the speed of light or the expansion rate of the universe or the cosmological constant. So I've been writing about these because this, this is a kind of design that can't possibly be explained by any being within the cosmos because it's built into the very fabric of the universe from the very beginning. From the Big Bang forward, we've had this exquisite fine-tuning. So one of the first discoveries of this fine-tuning was uh, made by Fred Hoyle, who was, uh, at that point in his career, a very aggressive, or, or, or let's say overt, uh, atheist. He had proposed the steady state theory of the origin of the universe as an alternative to the Big Bang because he saw that the Big Bang had obvious theistic implications. If the universe has a beginning, the material, if the material and physical universe has a beginning, then you can't, can't posit uh, some material cause beyond the universe to bring it into existence because matter and energy are what are coming into existence. And so Hoyle was troubled by that and came up with this steady state idea. It ultimately didn't really pa it didn't ta uh, pass the test of experience. Many observations were made that refuted it. But in the 50s, he had an overt, uh, 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 an abrupt change of of metaphysical position of worldview when he discovered the fine tuning that was necessary, the multiple fine tuning parameters that were necessary to make carbon possible and oxygen possible. And he was a stellar astrophysicist and and realized that that to get, uh, it, was, it was called the, the, the resonance levels of carbon, the precise energy levels at which carbon would form from lighter elements, that all, a whole host of other fine-tuning parameters had to be just right. In particular, the, the, uh, the heat inside, st uh, inside stars during fusion, and that required very fine, finely tuned uh, amount of gravitation, a little mu too much one way, a little too little the other, and things wouldn't, carbon would not be possible. Without carbon, you couldn't get complex chemistry. Without complex chemistry, you couldn't get life. And so there's been, I think, there's about three dozen of these fundamental fine-tuning parameters that have to be exactly right and within very narrow tolerances. So the physicists now sometimes talk about us living in a kind of Goldilocks universe where gravitational, gravitational force constant is not too strong, not too weak. The electro, uh, electromagnetic force constant, not too strong, not too weak. The ratio between the two constants, very precise to make complex chemistry possible. And on and on it goes. And then the other form of fine tuning is the fine tuning that's required at the very beginning of the universe in the configuration of mass energy. Uh, we live in a universe now where you look out in the night sky, um, if you have the right kind of telescope, you can see these beautifully ordered galaxies. But for there to be the amount of order we have in the universe now, there had to be an even greater amount of order, of, uh, of low entropy at the very beginning of the universe. And the physicist uh, Roger Penrose has calculated that degree of, of, of uh, entropy fine-tuning, of initial entropy fine-tuning, and he's come up with a, an incredibly uh, tiny exponential ratio, one in 10, a hyper exponential, one in 10 to the 10 to the 123. You can't, you can't even get your mind around a number like that. So it, it, at every level, the universe in, in the setup job at the beginning, in the fine tuning of the constants, the strength of the fundamental forces, 
And then finally, in the, in the structure of our solar system as well, uh, as I mentioned, we're just the right distance from just the right kind of sun with just the right axial tilt, with a Jupiter big gas giant sweeping the outer parts of the solar system, um, uh, uh, protecting us from asteroids. It's, it's just exquisite, all the factors that have, are just right to allow for first complex chemistry and then a, a life-friendly planet like Earth. So uh, if you start thinking about all that, you take it a little less for granted. <laughs> That's so true. You know, I, when, when you speak like this, it, it brings tears to my eyes because, because when, when you study the science and you think about how marvelous it is, you look at this and you say, this is just amazing the way these pieces have come together. So for example, in a, in a cell, all of these different interactions are going and all of these different pieces. I want to do a thought experiment so that so maybe the audience can realize, you know, Steve and I sometimes can, we'll call each other for some short little thing and we'll end up spending over an hour on the phone speaking together about, uh, about whatever topic is, is, is latest to speak about in science. And, and uh, uh, so, Steve, think, think about this thought experiment. People always want to take the, the basic chemicals and make them. So you've got to have the nucleic acids, the amino acids, the lipids, and the, the saccharides. They always try to make these. It's, they're abysmal at trying to make these under any prebiotic conditions. And generally, when they're made, they're racemic. They're not, they're not optically pure. And if there is some chirality, the optical purity is very low. But then stringing them together is another problem. But say you had all these pieces, and how do you assemble them into a cell? We have no idea how to assemble them into a cell, how to take, how to take this, these, these, this DNA and wrap it around a histone to just get the, the enzymes just going just right to do that. We're, we're clueless on these sorts of things. But let's, in this thought experiment, say we already have a functioning, working cell. So everything is in place, but now the cell just dies, just died a nanosecond ago. It just died. What did we just lose and what would we have to do to get it going again? Because everything is approximately in place. Have we any idea mm -hmm. how to get this cell going again? It, well, it's the Humpty Dumpty problem, right? <laughs> You've got all of these pieces, but all those pieces does not a living organism make. And uh, there's a, the, a more technical name for this problem in Origin of Life Studies, as you know, the, the, the Leventhal paradox. You know, you've got the, and e even if you start with all the proteins, it turns out, the number, of the, the, the number of different ways of arranging all those proteins that have nothing to do with life vastly outstrips is a huge exponential number. It's 10 to the 66 million or something. I have, I have to look it up. I was just writing about it, but it's a huge exponential number. 10 to the 79 billion. 10 to the 79 no, billion in a single billion. cell. That's right. Yeah. 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 The, the, uh, the 60, 10 to the 66 million is the number of, um, of uh, different models, uh, inflationary cosmological models that do not result in uh, in a life friendly universe, so that's a, another one of these you know fine tuning parameters. I get, got the two huge exponential numbers mixed up, but yeah, that that Leventhal thing. So you've got all these different pieces. You have all the right pieces. Original life scientists are are straining to get amino acids under realistic prebiotic conditions, and have you shown so beautifully. They, they can't do it without all kinds of investigator interference. They have to use co very precise recipes and introduce the right reagents at the right time and remove the byproducts that they don't want so they don't get inter interfering crass reactions. And all they're getting in the end of the day is amino acids, which are just components of pro proteins that have to be arranged in very precise order. Well, the Leventhal paradox is, well, I'll give you all the, I'll give you all the proteins. And even with all the proteins, there's so many different possible ways of arranging them that don't result you know, in a, an integrated living cell that you're, you're faced with these enormous search problems that, uh, that uh, are vastly beyond the, what we call the probabilistic resources of the universe. So the undirected uh, chance plus necessity approach to the origin of life, I think, seems uh, really hopeless. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's a non-starter. Intellectually, if you're really honest about what it takes to build a living organism, even the very simplest living organisms.
Yes, I agree. Now, since you're, since you're a philosopher as well, so tell, tell me, when we've just lost this functioning of the cell, the cell has just stopped working, so it's no longer alive. What is life? What is it we just lost? Tell it to me. What is? It, what have we just lost? Uh, what do they say in legal matters? That's a, a deep and imponderable question. I mean, I don't think people have tried in vain to define life, and uh, we we can we can define the necessary conditions of life, but we've all I think had the sense that there's something about life that's greater than the sum of its parts, and you have you don't have to be a cell biologist to know this. If you've ever lost a person that you love and you're with them at that moment of death. All the parts are still there, but the person is no longer there. What is that that's left? Um, you know, in the, in the biblical view, it's a spirit, a soul, a mind, and a spirit. Uh, it's something immaterial. And um, now, I don't know when we're talking about a living cell as opposed to a human being. Of the human being, I'm sure there's a spirit um, and a mind. Um, you know, but. There's something mysterious about life that we, we haven't really come to grips with. We, we know what's necessary from the standpoint of the, the physical substrates, what has to be in place to make life possible. But when life leaves, we don't exactly know what it is that's left, but we know something is left and it's not just the physical. Yeah, you know, if, if I could just try to, to reduce this to something utterly amazing that, that maybe our audience, those watching, would, would want to think about. We are so clueless on this thing. If, if a cell just dies, it's hard for us to define what it is we just lost. Just try to describe mm -hmm. what life was. What is it? Is it just elect this potential across a bilayer? No, it's many, many, many things together, and we're not sure even how to define that thing, let alone make it from the bottom up. We are utterly clueless. And people, what happens is yeah. people think that scientists have already figured this thing out. And so they just kind of accept it. Well, scientists know how to do that. They don't. They're clueless. Share, share something on this, Steve. And even more so when it comes to the origin of life. It's hard enough to define what it is. But as you've shown, trying to explain how it got here from a prebiotic soup or whatever the theories. I mean, you and I both have a deep interest in this question. I did my PhD on it. And, and uh, my first book, as you, you kindly shared with your audience, was, was about that. And you've been writing these fantastic articles for Inference and other places, um, holding these guys to account because the, the, our students are told that we do have this all figured out, that um, chemistry in a, in a warm little pond or in a prebiotic soup uh, would have, with the right spark, uh, or lightning or something would have would have reacted and naturally and gotten more and more and more complex and um, we found that you actually in the laboratory you can't move life in a life or you can't move the chemicals in a life friendly direction without repeated interventions of intelligent investigators and if, to my way of thinking these simulation experiments in origin of life research or origin of life studies they have a particular logic about them. They're, they're based on uniformitarian reasoning. The present is the key to the past. What we see happening in the laboratory is our guide to understanding what is plausible to think might have happened in the past. So when these investigators time and time again can't form even protein, proteinaceous amino acids without in a sense, cooking the book, setting up the experiment in just the right way, introducing just the right reagents in just at just the right time, removing the stuff so they don't get the interfering cross reactions, et cetera, et cetera. What are they actually simulating? It seems to me they're simulating the need for a mind to move the chemicals in a, in a life friendly direction. And at the same time, we still don't have a definition of what life is. We know it when we see it. We know when it's gone, but we know and we know it's necessary. We know we need uh, we need energy. We need to hold a complex system far from thermodynamic equilibrium. We need information. We need uh, metabolic pathways. We need various things to make life. But those are necessary conditions that all have to be in a precise configuration with each other in order for there to be life as a whole. And yet, we, so we don't really have a complete definition, but the origin of life is utterly mystifying from a materialistic point of view. And every attempt to, to simulate it seems to suggest the need for a designing intelligence to superintend over the process. 
Yeah, it's 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 interesting to to sit with you because because you and I have attended meetings together for the last several years, and we hear different people come up with their different little proposals. And as soon as you ask for details, it goes into storytelling, and uh, uh, it's just how utterly clueless we are. Let me let me tur- begin to turn this in another direction because you had mentioned something about about uh, um, this non-equilibrium. One of your colleagues, Brian Miller, Dr. Brian Miller, so, so he, he, writes about, uh, um, he writes about this not from the perspective that I do. I look at this from a synthetic organic chemist. He's writing about this as a physical chemist, and he writes this, and I, then I want you to unpack this. So listen to this carefully, what he writes. He's, yeah, and and right. many people say that the simplest of life is a bacterium. So he says, bacteria of all levels of complexity must generate in their cells, in their cell membranes, at least 100,000 ATP molecules per second per micron squared to simply maintain their integrity against the constant thermodynamic forces disrupting their homeostatic stability. A drop in power results in the metabolism halting and the cell irreversibly decomposing into an amorphous conglomeration of simpler chemicals. So explain to us what this means that life is, is a non-equilibrium system and how, it, how, how nature tries to move things toward an equilibrium and what all this means. Right. Let me put the, this discussion in a little broader context. There's been a kind of a back and forth. Uh, uh, the old line creationists used to say that the uh, the life couldn't have evolved because it violates the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, because living systems are highly ordered, things tend to go from disorder to order, from high, from low to high entropy. High entropy being um, more disorder, low entropy being more order. The standard evolutionary response was, well, that's true as far as it goes, but it's overly simplistic. If you push energy through a system, you can maintain a higher level of order um, because of the energy moving through the system in a localized environment. You can have, overall, you'll still have um, uh, more disorder, but in a localized environment, you can maintain a high degree of order providing you're pushing energy through a system. And since our sun is pumping energy into Earth all the time, we can have high, high order in our localized environment, even though in the solar system as a whole, we're moving towards disorder. Um, and that's true as far as it goes. We have lots of examples of that. A tornado um, will create, you know, the energy that, that produces the tornado creates a, a localized increase in order um, uh, with a swirling vortex. But <clears throat> the problem is with these non-equilibrium systems that what they, what, the kind of order that's produced has nothing to do with the kind of order we see in biology. Uh, it's a highly symmetric order, like a swirling vortex, or think of, un, you know, also you could unplug your bathtub and see that make, make a vortex. Gravitational energy will produce that order. The kind of order we have in life is not repetitive order or symmetric order. It's, it's actually information, and, or it's complex order. And so uh, these non-equilibrium thermodynamics uh, explanations do a good job of explaining what doesn't need to be explained in life. If, if, if you think of the genetic code or any sequence of digital characters, if you, if you get a re- repeat, you know, ABC, 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 or in the genes, if you got AG, 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 that would be a, a highly repetitive order, but it's not informational. It doesn't have the capacity to produce a complex three-dimensional protein fold. That type of what, what's required there is much more like language. Uh, I use an example in my book of, uh, of, a, of a series of, of, of randomly arranged characters, a series of repetitive characters, and then a sequence like time and tide wait for no man. That third type of sequence we say is specified and complex. It's the kind of it's the kind of order we have in information. It's its arrangements are not rigidly repeating, and yet it's specified in order to perform a function. And so that's what, what the kind of thing that's got to be explained in biology, not just something like a vortex or a, 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 a swirling, um, a swirling uh, tornado. Now, recently, there's been a scientist, uh, uh, Jeremy England, who was at MIT, now he's at Georgia Tech, who's uh, written on something called, uh, they're called dissipation theorems. And these purport to show that you can have, life is special in two ways. It's special because 
it's a low entropy system and it also has a lot of en energy it's high thermal energy and to get those two things is highly highly ordered but in a specific informational way and it's got in its storing energy and so that that makes life very difficult to explain it's unusual if we look out we see lots of things that have energy in them but they're not highly ordered especially not with informational order and we see lots of things that might be low entropy but they don't have energy life has those two things in concert now there are these dissipation theorems that say that that can happen in very specific circumstances. And so Jeremy England wrote some articles saying, hey, maybe this is a, a way that, that uh, this might show some promise for explaining the origin of life from purely physical thermodynamic considerations. What Brian showed, however, was that these same dissipation theorems show that to get low entropy and high thermal energy in the same system, you can do it, but you can only do it if you have an engine that converts energy in very specific ways to that low entropy system and also if only if you have information so you need an engine and information in fact to build engines like atp molecules inside cells um, you've got to put a lot of proteins together in a very particular way so you're going to need a lot of information so you you can you can get the you can get the order for free if you have the pre-existing information. And that's been the whole, case, the whole basis of our case for intelligent design in life, is that information is something that we know only arises from a mind, from an intelligence. So these dissipation theorems that looked like they were gonna provide an avenue for explaining the origin of life from fundamental physical principles, actually just underscored in a new way the need for prior unexplained information, information that we think, again, can only be explained by reference to a mind. Good, good. Well, thank you, thank you. And and uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna follow on that same thought. I'm speaking right now to Dr. Stephen Meyer, and so, Dr. Stephen Meyer, I'm gonna follow along that same thought. You know that that I have not been a proponent of intelligent design, though I'm quite sympathetic with the arguments. Neither have I contested with intelligent design. My whole argument has been I don't have a chemical tool to measure it. And I am holding my colleagues to using our chemical tools to define what they're, they're, they're proposing. So they tell these stories and they say, okay, well, what chemical tool did you use so that you could tell me this story? What was it that you measured? So what would you say that, that, that to, to move me even closer toward intelligent design, if I don't have a tool to measure it, what, is the way, what are the ways that are being thought about to really put a measure on this because your colleague, Dr. Brian Miller, told me that that's what they're moving toward. Well, uh, it's a great, a great question. And, and it, this is one, but what's been so uh, enjoyable for me about our conversations is that in a sense, we're looking at the same reality, at two sides of the same coin, because you've been analyzing these prebiotic si simulation experiments and showing that um, the chemistry doesn't want to do what the origin of life biologists say it must do in order to produce life, right? It just, it's not, uh, 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 it doesn't move in a life-friendly direction. Uh, in those first Miller-Urey experiments, it, unless there was the investigator interference to prevent the interfering cross-reactions, this experiments would terminate in a substance called melanoidin, which was a kind of sludge that had absolutely nothing to do with life. So the investigator had to reach in and take out the byproducts that they didn't want and make sure that, you know, that, that they didn't get those interfering cross reactions and then introduce something else at just the right time. And, and still we didn't get very far along the way. So you've just done this fantastic job with the, 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 the benefit of your expertise in synthetic organic chemistry of showing this fundamental truth that, 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 that the chemistry, organic chemistry does not move in a nat naturally in a life friendly direction. And what you've done is you've called out these investigators for the way in which they've interfered with the experiments, where they've set them up, they've choreographed them, they've interfered, and used their own intelligence to get what limited positive results are possible. And, and so that, I think, has been a really powerful negative critique of the plausibility of these origin of life scenarios. What I've done in looking at the logic of origin of life simulation experiments and in the logic of historical scientific um, theorizing 
is to show that there's also a positive case for intelligent design. In part, it's based on, on something we can measure, and that is the amount of information that is present or would need to be present in even the simplest living cell. Because we have uh, the ability to calculate very precisely the probabilistic resources of the entire universe. And I made some of these calculations in Signature in the cell. Uh, so if you get beyond a particular threshold of information, we know that it's going to be, it will always be more, more, uh, more likely that undirected material processes did not produce that information than it is that the undirected material processes did produce that information. And we're way beyond that threshold. And I, I unpack that, that um, quantitative threshold and the, and the sort of probabilistic argument in signature in the cell. But there's more to the case for intelligent design than just the measurement of information. It's also our uniform and repeated experience of what it takes to generate information. And here I build in my case for intelligent design off of the work of Charles Darwin and the other 19th century uh, historical scientists who developed a method of reasoning for investigating um, the events in the remote past and what caused those events. And their key insight was, if you want to explain a, an event in the remote past, you need to posit a cause which is known in our experience, in our present experience, to produce the effect in question. And I came across this first in the work of, of Darwin and then in Lyell. Lyell had a long Victorian subtitle on his famous book, of Principles of Geology. And it was being an attempt to explain the former changes of the Earth's surface by reference to causes now in operation. That's the critical methodological principle in historical science. And origin of life biology is an historical science. So if we want to figure out what caused life to come into existence or what caused the information necessary to produce life, we need to ask, well, what is the cause now in operation that produces information? And as I began to frame that question, I realized we know of only one such cause that produces information, especially information in a digital form, such as the information we find in D DNA and RNA. And that cause is an intelligent agent. Whether we're talking about a hieroglyphic inscription or a paragraph in a book or digital code in a, in a computer program or information embedded in a radio signal, whenever we trace information back to its ultimate source, we always come to a mind, not an undirected process. And now, curiously, even origin of life uh, biochemists have confirmed this principle with their very simulation experiments that you've critiqued so powerfully. Because what they've shown is that to, to get, for example, uh, there's, there's a particular type of origin of life experiment uh, called a ribozyme engineering experiment, where the origin of life scientists are trying to produce an RNA molecule that will both store information and catalyze reactions, and hoping, perhaps, and even hoping that they'll they'll get one that can partially copy itself, a replicase, to get some kind of natural selection going at a prebiotic level. To date, they've been able to engineer RNA molecules that can copy about 10% of themselves. But to do that, the origin of life biochemist, the ribozyme engineer, has to precisely sequence the nucleotide bases on the RNA molecule to get even that limited self-replicating capacity, uh, to make even that limited capacity possible. So what's being simulated? What's being simulated is that to generate information, you need a mind. Even RNA world experiments are showing this same principle, that intelligence is the prerequisite of information. And uh, I remember years ago at that same conference, you gave that excellent talk on how information could exist in the cloud because we can put it there. Because if there's a mind, you can put information in a cloud. It can be stored on any material medium. So I think both our ordinary experience and our scientific experiment, uh, scientific experience has confirmed this principle that information always comes from a mind. So the discovery of information at the foundation of life therefore becomes a powerful indicator of prior intelligent activity using the methodological principles and the scientific method of reasoning that Darwin himself employed in, in the uh, uh, origin of species. So a proper historical scientific inference. Okay. Well, that, that sort of uh, answers one of the first questions that's popped up from the audience. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Um, start reading off some, some questions from the audience. And, and uh, there's several of them, so, so try, to, try to answer them fairly concisely, Steve. 
says, Dr. Meyer, how would you combat somebody who believes in the multiverse, an infinite number of universes, so that life had to happen eventually? Lots of physicists will now say, you know, you've got a choice in how to interpret the fine-tuning evidence. You can either say it's the result of uh, some kind of supermind, a theistic design interpretation, or you can opt for the multiverse. It's kind of a wash. Um, the multiverse is the idea that there are billions of other universes out there such that the incredible improbability associated with the fine-tuning of the laws and constants of physics and initial conditions of the universe um, it are uh, that, that improbability gets massively diminished because the, the there are so many universes that the, the right conditions had to arise somewhere. The problem with this explanation, there's multiple problems, but the biggest one is this, that you can't just posit other universes, because if all the other universes are, are separate from ours, having no causal interaction, then things that happen in those other universes don't affect anything that happens in our universe, including the probabilities of the fine-tuning. So proponents of, of the sort of naturalistic approach to explaining the fine-tuning realize that, and realize that to explain the origin of the fine-tuning, they needed in a universe-generating mechanism, something that would allow them to portray our universe as the outcome of a kind of cosmic lottery in which the universe generating mechanisms were spitting out lots of different universes and would then ours just happen to be just happen to be the lucky one and um, and that's where the rub comes in because both of the speculative cosmologies that have been used to posit or to explain the the multiverse or to generate multiple universes inflationary cosmology and um, and uh, string theory require universe me generating mechanisms that themselves require prior unexplained fine tuning. So in the, infl in the inflationary uh, uh, universe, for example, the inflaton field has to uh, uh, shut off with just the right energies in just the right narrow window of time. And there's an incredibly precise fine tuning associated with that. So in order to explain fine tuning, you posit a multiverse, but for the multiverse to actually explain fine tuning, you need a universe generating mechanism, but the universe generating mechanisms require prior unexplained fine tuning. So you, the multiverse doesn't really get rid of the fine tuning, it just pushes it back one generation. Good, I remember you and I were at a meeting one time together and a Nobel laureate uh, was pushed a little bit on giving an explanation for this and he said, well, we're here, so it must have happened. Yes, yeah. And that was as good as he could get. And, yeah. and I remember you and I looked over at each other like, uh, boy, we wish he had some more substance than that. You get the same thing with the origin of life problem. Is since we're here, it must have evolved by chemical evolution, but uh, we don't have a model and we don't have a plausible reaction. But since we're here, it must have happened. But there, what's assumed in that is that it must have happened materialistically. And there's an, obviously another alternative explanation. It may have been designed. Right. Same thing with, the, with the, the, the fine tuning of the universe. Right. So here's another question. It's this type of question that gets me angry, but you're, you're a much calmer person than I am. Uh, a documentary I saw said, it's possible to have the universe pop into existence on its own entirely spontaneously, entirely uncaused, and entirely in accordance with the laws of physics. What's your answer to that? Um, well, I, uh, it's, uh, these questions are fun and great because I've just been writing on all of this. This is my new book, uh, Return to the God Hypothesis, is, is specifically addressing the counter arguments to the fine tuning argument, which is the multiverse, and the counter arguments to the cosmological first cause argument, which is something called quantum cosmology, which is what this uh, the documentary was referring to. And the idea there is that the um, the universe can be when when the universe is very very small inside what's called Planck time, it would have been small enough to be describable by the uh, the, the mathematics associated with quantum physics. And um, the, there's a couple of very weird paradoxes that are, are strange things that come out of this. This has been invoked as a way of getting around the idea that of the of the Kalam first cause argument. Whatever begins to exist must have a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, there, the universe must have had a cause. Since causes are separate from themselves, the cause must be a transcendent cause, something beyond matter, space, time, and energy. 
That's been a, an increasingly popular argument marshaled by people like William Lane Craig and based on the discovery that the universe did in fact have a beginning. This quantum cosmology stuff has been a tr an attempt to circumvent that by saying, well, in the smallest smidgens of time just after the beginning, the universe could have been described using quantum physics. And there's, they, they use something called a universal wave function that describes all the possible states of affairs the universe might have had, and then it claim that if the universal wave function that comes out of these equations of quantum physics describes a universe like ours it explain as one of the possibilities then it explains the origin of our universe a couple weird problems though before there's a universe the quantum cosmologists depict reality as essentially purely mathematical it's simply this universal wave function and one of the most perceptive of these physicists uh, Alexander Vilenkin has said well wait a minute if before there's a physical universe, all there is is this universal wave function describing mathematically all the possible universes that could exist. That's a purely mathematical reality. And math typically exists in minds. Are we then saying by our quantum cosmological modeling of the origin of the universe that the universe came out of a mind? He raises that as a rhetorical question in the last chapter of his book, um, The uh, Many Worlds in One, and never really answers it. Hawking, who also was a proponent of quantum cosmology, asked a similar question. He said, what puts fire in the equations that gives them uh, a, a world to describe? Math by itself has no causal efficacy. It isn't something that causes things to happen. Math is something that exists in a mind that we use to describe things that happen in the world. So these types of explanations depend on the strange proposition that math produces matter. And that's very weird. Uh, and in fact, it seems to be almost platonic and certainly a bit theistic because math also in our experience only exists in a mind. And secondly, prior to all that, to get this universal wave function that's supposedly explaining the origin of the universe from math alone, there's a prior e equation that has to be solved called the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. It's the analog of the Schrodinger equation from, from uh, quantum physics. And that, that uh, equation can't be solved unless the physicist chooses uh, specific constraints on the equation. It otherwise has an infinite number of solutions unless the physicist constrains mathematical uh, f degrees of freedom by imposing what are called boundary conditions and boundary constraints. And those are always chosen with an end in mind to get a universe out the other end like ours. So it's very much like the original life uh, simulation experiments where the simulator, in this case the mathematical modeler, is constraining possibilities, inputting information to get an outcome that he wants. So I think, again, what's actually being simulated is the need for a creator or a mind to bring a universe like ours into existence. So even those quantum cosmological explanations that say you get universe to pop into existence from the laws of physics alone um, presuppose some things that are really very theistic in, in their implications. Okay, the next one. Is it possible God made other forms of life on other galaxies or universes with their own rules, i.e. Bible? If so, would that undermine the argument for intelligent design? Also, what about SETI program? Doesn't the method that we use to search for alien life argue for intelligent design? Great question. Let me take the second one first. It's a, a bit more straightforward. Uh, the, the SETI uh, method is in fact predicated on the assumption that information in the, in, in the, in the digital and specified form that we, we define carefully in, among ID proponents uh, is a, a, a definitive indicator of intelligence. So they're looking for, for things like the, uh, the prime number sequence, okay, something like that. And if they find it, they're going to say, ah, that's an intelligent agent. There's, that's, that's information embedded in a radio signal. So the presupposition of SETI is that information, specified complexity, is an indicator of intelligent activity. Uh, they haven't found that yet in any radio signal or any other signal coming from outer space. But it's interesting that it presupposes the very method of design detection that's used by intelligent design proponents. And that, secondly, we found that kind of information at the foundation of life in DNA and RNA and proteins. Um, as for life on another planet, I think, or in other, probably other galaxies, we know there is no life on the other planets in our solar system. We have now found some extrasolar planets, but as I understand it, um, they have highly uh, eccentric orbits. 
uh, all the ones that have been identified are not life friendly and that they pass way too close and, w and come way too far away from their host suns. Uh, the temperature variations are too great. Um, but if life were found on another planet, I don't think that would undermine the case for intelligent design. Likely, if we studied that life, it would require prior foundational information as well, and that would be an indicator of intelligent design. We don't have any indication from, the, from science or from the Bible that there is life in other places, but it's, it's not impossible from either perspective. So I'm, I'm, I'm open to that, and I don't think it's, a, it, it's dispositive for the question of intelligent design one way or another. Should we so find you're, it? You're really, we haven't yet. <laughs> you're, really, you're really good at answering these. Uh, Dr. Meyer, what arguments do naturalists slash materialists think are practical in understanding that the material world as we know it had a beginning slash the Big Bang? Well, um, that's a, another great question, and it's a wonderful story of how we discovered the beginning. Jim and I were at a conference a couple summers ago with a, a French astrophysicist, Jean-Pierre Luminet, who's written a book uh, in, in French uh, about the, events, the invention of the Big Bang. And, the, and, the, and it's a fascinating story. The key evidence, I think, the first big evidence, was the discovery that the galaxies are moving away from us. And that was, uh, the evidence of that was provided by the red shift, the, the, um, the spectral signatures of the light coming from distant galaxies were shifted in the red end of the ultraviolet spectrum. And the red end is the longer wavelengths, so that suggested that the light was being stretched out. Light gets stretched out as objects move away. And so as we, the astronomers began to survey the night sky, they found in every quadrant of the night sky, there was uh, the, the light coming from the distant galaxies was shifted in that uh, red direction. Well, with a few anomalies here and there, but overwhelming testimony of an expanding universe. So that was the, the first big thing. The other thing, the, the other really big um, indicator came out of theoretical physics with Einstein's theory of general relativity and the field equations of general relativity that were later solved by Hawking and Penrose and George Ellis. And uh, this suggested a, a, that uh, Einstein's theory was that, that matter curved space and he knew that if matter, if all, therefore, that if, if gravitation was the only force in the universe, then we should have long ago collapsed in on, all the matter should have collapsed in on itself, and we should have a kind of giant black hole. But since we don't live in that kind of universe, we live in a universe with celestial bodies with great deal of space between them, there must be some counteracting force of expansion. And if there's an expanding force, then that implies most likely that we live in a dynamic universe that is is expanding in size. And Einstein didn't like that implication at first. He tried to gerrymander his uh, the forces with, a, with something called the cosmological constant and give it exactly the right value so that the expanding force and the contracting force were just right. But that level of fine tuning was A, implausible, and it didn't work, and then later they found the evidence of the expansion with the red shift. Then there were a whole series of other evidences that came online, the cosmic background radiation and others. So the, the, the evidence for the Big Bang is, I think, widely accepted by scientists of all philosophical persuasions. Um, the question is, what do you make of it philosophically? I think it implies, the beginning implies a transcendent cause beyond matter, space, time, and energy. I think it does provide, it, I think the discovery does have theistic implications. Okay. Some people believe that scripture supports the theory that God created the earth, but then the earth was destroyed, i.e. Satan's fall, and then God recreated the earth. What's your opinion? Um, I've not heard too much about that. Um, I, I would say that in the... Uh, the uh, Proponents of intelligent design come in lots of different philosophical persuasions. Uh, most are theists, but some are agnostics. Uh, I happen to be a Christian and a proponent of intelligent design, and I think a biblical understanding of, of design in nature or, or of nature is twofold. We should expect from a biblical point of view, view to see evidence of, of, uh, of design, original design or aboriginal design. But from a biblical point of view, we should also expect to see evidence of decay. 
Uh, in fact, I think in Romans it says that uh, the, the, the nature is in bondage to decay, the, the, the created order is in bondage to decay. And um, so I become very interested in the, the, the evidence we have of both of those things. And I think uh, without getting into a very detailed what's called a theodicy of how evil entered the world, and theologians think about that a lot, um, I think generally we see exactly what we ought to expect from a biblical point of view. We see exquisite evidence of design, but we see evidence of that design being eroded or decayed or, or uh, degraded, or, uh, of degradation. And um, we have a, a colleague at uh, University of Idaho, Scott Minnick, who works on virulence. And he tells me that among microbiologists who look at virulent bacteria and viruses that are nasty to humans, that invariably what you have is either an information loss from an aboriginal system that wasn't harmful to us, or information being exp expressed out of its original and proper context. So I, I think that we're seeing at a microbiological level, both evidence of design and evidence of sub subsequent decay. That's after all what a mutation is. So um, I think the biblical natural theology or theology of nature comports well with what we see in nature. Okay. That, that uh, dovetails right into this question. All the recent talk of viruses has caused me to wonder about the idea of God breathing life into Adam. While Adam would, really, would already need to be alive to be affected by viruses as we understand them, this causes me to ponder how God breathing life into Adam could have been a far more literal process than I've previously considered. To borrow a phrase from the Green Mile, could God have somehow infected us with life? And could viruses be a key to understanding how something like this might have happened? Very interesting. Um, I was, this dovetails beautifully with the previous question. The, um, Scott Minnick has shown that, for example, the plague bacter bacterium, and we're not talking about viruses yet, but the bacterium, the plague bacterium, which is been a very striking example of what theologians call natural evil, it is the result of four discernible mutations from an aboriginal bacterium for which our uh, bodies had a natural immune response. Uh, it was a completely benign bacterium that was altered by this series of mutations. So that would be an example of that kind of decay or degradation of, an, of a beautifully and uh, well-designed original system. Now, we have another colleague, Don Ewart, who's a virologist, who's working on this same issue. Viruses cause a lot of problems, so what happened? Why are, were they originally designed, or were they... And he's working on a theory, uh, and there's quite a lot of support for this in general, that viruses have had an original role of, uh, effectively, they were part of an information processing system that maintained the proper balance of different bacterial organisms, for example, in the human gut or in the gut of or other mammals, that we need a particular balance of different bacterial species, and that viruses were a way of transferring genetic information laterally to maintain this proper balance of, of, the, of different species of bacteria in the larger bacterial populations. So that's, an, that's a new idea and a new take on this, but it's very interesting. And I, he's, he's working on a very detailed paper on it and finding a lot that supports it. So it's, an, it's a kind of an active area of interest for ID proponents. Um, the bacterial question is making a lot of sense as far as evidence of design and decay. And, uh, it, th and there's an interesting avenue of research developing or an interesting hypothesis that's being developed about, about viruses. So stay tuned on that. It's, uh, it, it's, it shows how uh, the ID concept is uh, generating a lot of new research ideas. Okay. As a philosopher of science, what do you think is the best way to differentiate scientific, philosophical, and religious questions and issues? Where do questions of design fit in? Uh, the second question is a bit easier to answer than the first. The, um, I think questions of design are questions of historical scientific research. Uh, you can use the method I described a bit earlier. It's called the method of multiple competing hypotheses. It's, used in, it's a standard method in geology, evolutionary biology, archaeology. It's a method that's used when you can't 
repeat something under controlled laboratory conditions necessarily and where you need to make an inference about past causes of events in the or, or uh, make an inference to determine the cause of an event in the remote past and so uh, design detection is a retrodictive inference we look at the an effect and try to determine what type of cause best explains it was it a uh, was it chance was it natural laws or necessity was it some combination of the two or was it an intelligent agent all of those are, are possibilities we know that intelligent agents act and they leave certain types of signatures of their activity behind when we find those signatures, it allows us to retrodict back to a designing mind. I think the crucial signature of intelligence is information. And so I think that's the type of inquiry that allows you to detect a design. That's a type of forensic science or historical science. It's part of what I characterized in my PhD thesis, and I've done a fair amount of further uh, writing on that in, in, in the books that Jim kindly showed at the beginning of the interview. Uh, so. That's the kind of science I think intelligent design is. It's different than straight bench science or theoretical physics. Uh, there are different types of science with sciences with different types of methods. And then that gets to the second question, how do we characterize science? Typically, in an undergraduate science class, we'll learn about the scientific method. But in fact, there are many different scientific methods. There are sciences that are concerned with classification. There are sciences that are concerned with uh, simulation. There are sciences that are concerned with uh, the form formulation of general physical laws. There are sciences that are more forensic in character that are trying to discern causal, um, provide causal explanations for particular facts or particular events. And all of these different types of sciences have different methods. And so the, the simplistic hypothetical deductive method that we all learn in, you know, physics uh, 110 or chemistry uh, 101, that's a, that's a good method, but it's not the only method of scientific reasoning. And so it, that recognizing that there is a multiplicity of methods makes it difficult to say how in general we distinguish science from philosophy or, or religion. And that's something uh, in philosophy of science known as the demarcation problem. It's a, a notoriously difficult thing to give a, a simple definition of science that allows us to distinguish science from these other modes of inquiry, especially because some of those modes of inquiry in philosophy and philosophy of science, that method of multiple competing hypotheses and inferring to the best explanation is used just as it's used in the historical sciences or sometimes in theoretical physics. So I'm of the opinion that there's not as much clear demarcation between the, the natural sciences and philosophy or philosophy of science as one might think. And even in religion, uh, we were talking at the very beginning of the interview about the resurrection. The, res the case for the resurrection is based on historical evidence, and it uses the same method of reasoning, namely inference to the best explanation. The apologetic case for the resurrection uses the same method of reasoning that Darwin used in The Origin of Species, the method of inference to the best explanation, trying to explain, explain what caused a particular fact or set of facts to arise in history. So. Uh, it's difficult to form a, a strict demarcation. I think it's easier to demarcate different types of scientific reasoning and different types of philosophical reasoning than to give one clear-cut science versus philosophy sort of uh, demarcation. But I write about that a, a fair bit in the end of Signature in the Cell, and I give a more complete uh, account of, of this problem, of definition. The, the key thing, though, is not how do you define an argument or how do you define the, uh, a, a truth claim, but whether or not the truth claim is true or false, is the argument valid or sound? So the case for, it doesn't so much matter whether the case for intelligent design is science or philosophy or a combination of the two, or historical science, what's of most concern is whether or not it's true, does the evidence support the claim based on our knowledge of cause and effect and so forth. Wow. You, you know, the, Sorry, the, no, you're amazing, yeah, That wasn't very Steve. succinct. I got, I, <laughs> No, 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 you, you're, you're well, amazing. You are too. It's just These amazing. are great questions. <laughs> um, you, you know, so somebody's asked me a question. The next question that's up here is, is to me, and I'm not even sure I can answer it. So, so it says, Dr. Tour, do you find the method of competing hypotheses that Meyer presents for the origin of life an adequate test? You know, I... I 
Steve, Stephen knows this. I look at this somewhat differently than, than would a philosopher of science. I just look at the chemistry, and it is glaring to me that, that uh, even with all of the input of, of the investigator, they still don't even get close because as human beings, we have no idea yeah. how to even influence the system to make it happen. So um, I don't I'm, I don't know how to really answer your question to me. I, I just uh, I just look at this very differently as a, as somebody who just has to make stuff all day rather than than uh, uh, thinking about the deep implications of it. Other than that, we have no idea how to do it. Steve, help me out here. Yeah, let me like run at that because I think actually our two ways of looking at this just dovetail beautifully. And in fact, what you're in the framework of the method of multiple competing hypotheses, what you've determined is that these proposed explanations for pre in prebiotic synthesis of whether it's uh, sugars or uh, amino acids or or uh, <coughs> uh, metabolic pathways or whatever. Um, th th that these proposed hypotheses lack causal adequacy. They're not consistent with what we know about what ordinarily happens in chemistry. So if you take Lyell's dictum that the present is the key to the past and we look at what chemistry does now, these hypotheses positing certain chemical processes as the basis for the organic synthesis of the prebiotic monomers or, or polymers or whatever, um, we can say those hypotheses are not causally adequate. They don't meet the test of experience. They're not consistent with our uniform and repeated experience of what chemistry does in the present. We don't have a cause now in operation that produces the, the thing that needs to be explained. So that what you're doing fits beautifully into the methodological framework that Origin of Life uh, people use, they say they use, although they often punt when they don't get the answer they want, but it, it, it fits into the, the methodological characterization of the field that I've provided, and that same methodological uh, framework is the basis, I argue, for making a positive inference for intelligent design. So we're on the same page here. I'm just doing a little bit of self-conscious characterization of the underlying methodology, and you're just saying as a chemist, gee, this flat doesn't work. And saying it flat doesn't work is another way of saying it lacks causal adequacy. These, th what they're positing as the cause doesn't produce the effect that's needed to produce life. There you go. There, there's, there's one final question here, and we're going to close with this one. And it, 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 it's actually related to the way you just finished. It's, it, they're, they're asking, Dr. Meyer, what's the difference between life and consciousness? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, maybe we just got just stumped the questioner or the, the question responder. Um, well, there are many forms of life that are um, e exhibit aversive responses to stimuli, which to which we would not attribute either sentience or consciousness. So, there are one-celled bacteria we do not think exhibit characteristics of conscious agency. Um, we know of consciousness. This is a great point that our, our colleague J.P. Moreland at Biola University makes. We know of the reality of consciousness because we are conscious minds ourselves. We have in direct introspective experience of what it means to be a conscious mind. And much of the rest of our knowledge of the world is, is um, derived indirectly or inferentially from that first person knowledge of being a conscious agent. So because we know of we understand intuitively the connection between our own conscious awareness and the kinds of uh, outcomes or, or behaviors that we can affect. I can pick up a ball and throw it because I have an intention to, to throw a strike across the plate. Um, I can write a sentence because I mean to communicate something. So I can infer the existence of other conscious minds because I can see the distinctive effects of my own consciousness being expressed by other conscious minds. I can also see that there are other types of organisms that exhibit lifelike behaviors that are uh, responding to their environment in various ways that don't exhibit the distinctive um, effects of conscious, conscious awareness. And so we've made this distinction, it seems pretty intuitive and obvious, uh, but we can unpack it if we think about it real carefully, between consciousness, sentience, and mere vitality. And there's a kind of a hierarchy in life, and we realize that 
some forms of life have consciousness like we do. Animals have a form of animal consciousness. In the Bible, it's, they're called the nefesh. They have a mind, but not a spirit. Um, and then there are things like bacteria and plants that have uh, clearly exhibit lifelike characteristics without that. So I think that's about the best we can do. I don't know if we can get a great definition, but what we know of consciousness, I think we know very well. And a lot of the problem of materialism in science is that we want to we want to say mind is somehow not a factor. But scientists who say that forget the role of their own minds. They're they're impervious or uh, to the role of their own minds, and I think that's a mistake. And it shows up in particular in Origin of Life chemistry, where the mind of the scientist is the crucial factor driving the chemistry forward, and yet the scientist is completely oblivious to that. Well, maybe I, we'll I agree there. with I'm, that. I might be talking myself into uh, a yeah, we'll stop there. <laughs> I, I, I agree with that, Dr. Stephen Meyer. I agree with that, that, uh, that uh, scientists are really oblivious to their own consciousness and what's going on in the experiments that they do in this area. And, um, you know, one day I was, I was building what was called a synthetic brain. And this was right around 2000, 2001, in that time period under a DARPA contract. And I had said that we were going to build this brain and it was going to be semi-conscious, knowing from computer science that to, to define consciousness is very hard. So I called it semi-conscious. And at that point, I knew nobody was going to argue with me because it was too complex to, to figure out what I might have meant. But Steve, I want to thank you so much for joining us on, on uh, you know, this, this beginning podcast that I have, the science, the science and Faith podcast with Dr. James Tour. You've just brought out so much, and it, it's just fun listening to you and your ability to pull from philosophy and science across from, from, from the geological to the, the biological and the chemical and just pack all this together in a single talk after talking to us about the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is absolutely the most important thing in life. And the other thing it demonstrates is that you can be, be a conscious individual with a huge amount of in, in, uh, uh, education in, in uh, uh, physics and in science and philosophy and still believe wholeheartedly in the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he has risen from the dead and his life, because he lives, we live also. His life in us is the, what, what takes us and elevates us into a relationship with his father. It is all because of Jesus. He is so good. Thank Changes you, Steve. Changes everything, absolutely, my friend. And it's always a pleasure to interact with you.